The Bible doesn't need any help. The Bible isn't intended to be read. It's intended to be studied. And we need to all speak the same thing. Thank everybody for coming. I appreciate y'all for being here. I'm thanking everybody early so y'all won't get mad at me and leave. Today, we're going to have an open book Bible test. Okay, it's a, it's a test, but it's an open book test. And my goal is to get all of God's children, all of God's people to worship God. But I also have a desire to see God's people become Bible scholars. I want God's people to find a love for the Bible, to read it more often and to be comfortable with it. Other religions got us beat. They know their book. And I'm trying to raise our biblical scholar level. I'm trying to get us to the point where we know the Bible. We can we can we can open and go to the Bible and get to our scripture and be able to to talk about that scripture and get to a commentary and be able to explain it and be able to win a soul with a book in our hand. It would be amazing. If we could take that book and go to any center and uh, under a vida anywhere. Use that book. Use the word of God. If we have the right tool which is the power of God, and we have the Bible in our hand, we should be able to use that book with our experience, yeah. with our testimony, and we should be able to save a soul. Mm -hmm. So this test is easy. It's really easy. Nobody's allowed to answer the questions. So I'm going to give you a, 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 a question. You're not allowed to answer it. That's why everybody should be muted. All right, so all you have to do is read the slide and answer the question within yourself. You just have to be honest. I'm going on a very system. Everybody's going to be honest. There's 12 questions. If you get 100%, great. Perfect. If you don't get 100%, then I need you to commit to coming at least at a minimum. We're here every Wednesday, but I need you to commit to come at least the last Wednesday of every month. Okay? If you don't get 100% on this test, then I need you to come at least the last Wednesday at 7 o'clock every month. You can view us on YouTube, on our live church channel, and also on Zoom. We're here every week. Okay. A newly saved person needs the truth. They can't be deceived anymore. They've already been deceived enough thinking they can live a life of sin, thinking they can go through life just being good, just being moral, and you'll be fine. Just don't worry. Just don't do really bad things. They can't come into the truth and be deceived again. So I want y'all to meet Jerome. My wife picks the names for all of our characters. She said his name is Jerome. He is Jerome. I want y'all to meet him. Somebody got to tell Jerome the truth. Jerome is a new convert and he's eager to learn about God, but he didn't grow up in church. But I got you, Jerome. Here's what you got to do. You got to get baptized in Jesus' name. It's not optional. You got to be filled with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is real and you got to be filled with the real Holy Ghost. It's critical. Thank you, Jesus. You got to present your body a living sacrifice. Holy. You got to live holy. Holiness is still right. The wages of sin is still death. When did it change? Show me the scripture in the Bible where God said you don't have to live holy anymore. Nah. We don't have youth. We don't have young people. We don't have millennials coming to church anymore because they say we patronize them. They say they don't want these goofy programs that the church keeps trying to entice them with. They want the truth. They need the truth. There's a 16, 15, 16 year old boy that I was talking to. This boy has never been to church in his life. His mother, she, his mother has never been to church. His grandmother been to church once for a funeral. That's the world we live in. How do we witness? How do we reach somebody that has never been to church? They have no background. They don't know anything about God. They don't know anything about the Bible. The Bible requires all of us to speak the same thing and have no divisions. First Corinthians says, now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. How can we speak with the same mind if we're all reading different books? Oh, no. All of these funny Bibles are leading people astray. We're going to talk right. about that soon. I'll send you the date, but we're going to talk about it real soon. I'm going to show you how the NIV is an extremely racist Bible. Okay, yeah. question number one. Y'all ready? Uh -huh. This is your first question. Don't answer it. I don't want to hear anybody in the, in the, in the chat or... Um, don't unmute your mic and answer it. I need you to answer this question amongst yourself. How many animals of each kind did Noah take on the ark? Ready? How many animals of each kind did Noah take on the ark? You know the answer? Yeah. Okay. How did Noah know how many, which animals were clean and which animal wasn't? Uh oh. The Bible says of every clean beast. Clean. So this is the difference. Thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of the beasts that are not clean by two. Did you not know that? Did you spend your whole life thinking that he only took two? 
Is it because you didn't read this or because you just heard somebody say it? This is clearly the Bible. This is King James Version, Genesis 7, 2. Of every clean beast, take seven. Of every unclean beast, take two. Do you think that we should be eating the unclean animals since there's only two of them? Or do you think God intended us to eat the clean animals since there's seven of them? And again, how did no one know which animals were clean and which were not? All right, if you find yourself with a different understanding, please commit yourself to coming at least once because that was question number one. Unless you get all the questions exactly as the Bible says, then please consider signing up for my worship club. All right, everybody stay happy. We got a couple more. It's going to go quick. We got 11 more. If you have food to eat, the Lord has been good to you. You got joy in your heart. The Lord has been good to you. If he saved you and didn't tell anybody about your sins, and that's the greatest thing I like about God. Can you imagine if the requirement for salvation was that you had to come down front to church and you had to stand in front of everybody and you had to go through and list every single sin that you've committed. You have to tell us and tell the pastor and, and tell everybody everything. Isn't it nice that God just says, don't worry about it. Uh -huh. I'm gonna take all of your sins and I got a special seed called forgetfulness. And I'm gonna take all of those sins and I'm gonna just dump them in there and you won't have to worry about it anymore. He's not gonna bring it up. If you ever bring it up, because sometimes we don't forgive ourselves. If you don't, if you bring it up again, God doesn't even know what you're talking about. Once God has forgiven you, forget about it. He's forgiven you and you don't have to repeat it to him or anybody else. And nobody else can condemn you for it because God has, is a powerful God. And he's a forgiving God. He's a merciful God and he's full of grace. God is awesome. God is good. What, what, what would it be like if all of the good things about God was reversed? Like, for example, if you said you didn't have food to eat or that you did wake up in the hospital. That's why it should be no problem worshiping him in your own house. You don't, you don't have to wait till you get to church to raise your hands and praise God. Okay, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul, my soul, my soul, cries out hallelujah. Thank God for saving me. Is that Old Testament or is that New Testament? Is the Old Testament, this is question number two. Is that Old Testament or New Testament? If you search the Bible, you'll come up empty, just like this refrigerator, because it's not Old Testament, it's not New Testament, it's No Testament, because it's not in the Bible. <laughs> Can we please stop telling folks stuff that's in the Bible that's not in the Bible? All right, it doesn't matter the denomination. We comfort people with these words. This is question number three. All you gotta do is tell me who said this. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Tell me who said that. Don't answer, tell me who said that. Nobody said it. Stop <laughs> saying things that are not in the Bible. If you read the Bible, you'll see that it says something totally different. Second Corinthians 5, 8 says, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. See, Jerome is on his computer. He's searching for that scripture. He's searching for scriptures that are either taken out of context or simply don't exist. We can't remove words out of the scriptures to make it work for us and then try to add words so it makes sense. Why did you take willing and rather out of the word of God? Why did you add is to be to the word of God? It says, it doesn't say to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's not a scripture. Stop saying that it's not in the Bible. This is probably where they got it from. It's an error, but this is probably where they got it from. For I verily as absent in the body, but present in spirit. That's not the same thing. That's not even close. That's not even the same context. There's nowhere near it. So poor Drew home. He went home thinking he can find this in the Bible. How many times does this have to happen? How many times does Jerome have to go home and, and look through the Bible or try to find a scripture that doesn't exist? How many times did that have to happen before Jerome doesn't come back? How long can you believe in what you've already disproved? If he disproved that it's not in the Bible and he keeps coming to church and he keeps talking to you or keep talking to somebody and he keeps quoting scriptures that's out of context, how long before Jerome doesn't come back? Good. All right, I want to remind y'all not to get mad at me. All I'm doing is reading the scriptures. If you've Take misquoted or said a scripture out of context, just read it next time. I try my best. I try my best not to quote scriptures. Because what if I get it wrong? Mm -hmm. What if I lead somebody astray? How can we all speak the same thing? Somebody's going to have to change. Either somebody's going to have to stop reading the scriptures for what it says, or somebody's going to have to stop misquoting them. One of us is going to have to stop in order for us all to do like the Bible says we have to do. We got to speak the same thing. 
So I say that we all stop misquoting scriptures, stop taking scriptures out of context, and just open your Bible, get the app on your phone, and before you say it, you, if you got a scripture in your mind, you just take the Bible out and just read it. Just take a couple seconds. The, that Bible app, the King James Bible app is free. All right, crumbs from the table is gross, okay? I wouldn't want to eat crumbs from the table. Thank God that I've had a meal to eat every night this year. Thank God I've had a meal Man. to eat all week. Thank you, Jesus, that I had something to eat today. But if I had no choice, thank God for his goodness anyway. Yeah. If you ever had to eat out of a garbage if you never had to eat out of a garbage can, say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I saw somebody digging in a garbage can for food. It broke my heart. Nothing I can do about it. Nothing I can do about it. Or can we do something about it? Can we do we do we do something for people like that? Thank God for my cousin who's going out and he's feeding the homeless. God bless him. But if you've never had to eat out of the garbage, you never had to beg anybody for food. If you had something to eat, say thank you, Jesus. I hear people all the time saying, I'm starving. Shut your mouth. You don't know what it's like to be even hungry. Mm-hmm. Not hungry for real. God can show you what it's like to be hungry. All you got to do is swap your location yep. with somebody else. And whatever you're going through, they'll love it. And yep. you'll take their place and see what it's like to go a day or two days without water. A day or two days without something to eat. You better pray every time you get something to eat. Every time there's a plate before you, you need to say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you had to eat crumbs from, if you never had to eat crumbs that fell off the table, that means God is good to you. Yes. All right, listen to this one very carefully. Very carefully. Rich man went to heaven and Lazarus went to hell. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. It's not the same um, Lazarus that Jesus rose from the dead. You know why? Because this is a parable. Be that person that says what the Bible says and read the Bible instead of quoting it. Because now you'll have a person confused. New saints can't figure out when Jesus is using a parable or when he's telling you an actual story that actually happened. Why didn't Lazarus go to the bosom of the father? Why did it say he went to the bosom of Abraham and you just assume that's heaven? That's not what the Bible says. Let's say what the Bible say. The Bible says in John first, uh, the first, uh, first chapter of John 18, no man have seen God at any time, but only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father. So he could have said that. He could have said Lazarus went to the bosom of the father, but Jesus chose not to. He chose to say he went to Adam, uh, Abraham's bosom. That's not the same thing as heaven. He could have said heaven. You said heaven. You changed the scriptures. Can we stop doing that? Do not, according to Deuteronomy chapter four, also in Revelations, Deuteronomy says, you shall not add unto the word which I have commanded you. Neither shall you diminish aught from it. That means don't diminish anything from it. Don't do it. Don't add. Don't take away from it. Okay. All right, y'all. Here's a good one. This is question number five. We're almost done. Did Delilah shave or cut Samson's hair? We have a lesson coming soon that's called Your Hair is Holy. All right. Judges 16, 19. And she made him sleep upon her knees. That's his first problem. That's his first mistake. And she called for a man and she caused him to shave off the seven locks off of his head. Why did you think it says hair? Who told you it says hair? The Bible didn't say that. The Bible never said it says hair. Somebody taught you that because they want to remove the culture of people whose hair is naturally and can naturally be locked. Be real careful what you're taking out of the Bible. She did not cut his hair. She cut his locks. There is a difference. The Bible says there's a difference. There's a reason why the Bible used the word locks many times in the Bible, especially with with Samson. If you look further up, he'll tell you. Once again, he told her to, if you um, braid my locks, he tricked her and lied to her. If you read that story, you'll see locks. You won't see hair. Where we at now? Y'all got a hundred percent? She had to use the um, shaving because the locks, our locks, he yeah, had seven locks. That's the thing. Imagine trying to cut it. With or, stone. Exactly. Stop, stop reading those weird Bibles. Stop reading those real books. They're not even Bibles. They're just books with commentary. It's not the Bible. The word of God is a translation from what God said word for word verbatim. I don't want to hear what somebody think it says or what somebody interprets. I want to hear the word of God because it's the word of God that saves me. If I say I am going to cook dinner at five o'clock, dinner will be ready at five o'clock. If you go and tell somebody, he said dinner will be ready this evening. That's not what I said. 
That's a lie. They could show up at six o'clock and miss dinner, right? I didn't say that. You put that in there. Say what I said. Say what the Bible says. All right. These two, I'm not even going to be bothered with. I'm not even going to waste my time with these two because they're ridiculous. <laughs> Jesus born on Christmas. Jesus died on Good Friday. I'm not even going to, you know what? Yes, I am. I couldn't help it. Sorry. <laughs> Good Friday doesn't even exist. If you subscribe to me, you will see me giving a quick commentary on that. Good. There's no such thing as Good Friday. I know you celebrated Good Friday last week. There's no such thing. But the Bible says... As Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. God said it twice because he wants you to know. And you can go back and read Jonah and you'll find out. Three days and three nights. So let's try it. Let's count. Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. Three nights. You need three days. So that means Jesus rose on Monday. Why you go to church on Sunday then? If he died on Friday, you cannot get, go ahead, make it work. Go book a hotel for three nights and you tell me if you start your first night, you check in on Friday, tell me what day the three nights end. Okay. And this is why Jerome has walked away from the church. We offered him too much non-truth. What's so hard about showing what the Bible actually says? The only way that we're all going to speak the same thing is if you refrain from your own ideas and commentary, if you refrain from your own thoughts and simply read the word of God. So we blew it. But there's a way to get Jerome back. We all have to agree not to say anything that we that we haven't read. We have to agree that we have to make a, a, a real hard conscious effort to read the Bible. The other religions are scholarly. We aren't. We only know what our pastor said. How will we speak the same thing if you're reading one book and I'm reading another book? Right. If I'm reading the Bible, the King James Version of the Bible, you're reading something else. How is it possible for us to speak the same thing and you're reading them funny Bibles? Do you think I'm going to put down the Bible and pick up a translation? So we'll never, ever be speaking the same thing because I don't want to hear commentary. I want to hear what God said. I want to hear the word of God. I don't want you changing it at all forever. All right. Question number seven. The devil is in hell. Hell was created for the devil. It was not created for us. You have no reason to go there. There's no business. You have no business going there. You don't have to go there. He ha he his goal is to have some company in hell. So question number seven, the devil is in hell. And y'all got 100 percent yet? Hmm? No, he's not in hell. He's here deceiving you with soft things like scriptures, like some of the scriptures we ran over. <laughs> Come on, saints. Come on back to the word of God. Stop misquoting the Bible. Stop not reading the Bible. Read the Bible the next time you open your mouth and say the Bible says. Just read what the Bible says. And the Lord said unto Satan, whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in hell. Nope, in the earth. In earth and from walking up and down in it. Revelation says and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. That's when he gets sent into hell way later. He's not in hell now. He's fighting you right now. OK, let's stop saying what the Bible doesn't say. All right. Number eight. Money is the root of all evil. I'm sure you've heard that before. Right. Money is the root of all evil. Don't answer. Don't put it in the chat. Money is the root of all evil. Where is that in the Bible? Stop. You see what happens if you just take one word out? For the love of money. Yeah. People will have you thinking that money is a bad thing. People will have you thinking that you shouldn't uh, try to go to school and better yourself and get money so that you can have a better life. The Bible never says money is evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. Why can't we just say what the Bible says? Yeah. All right. Here's a, here's a very popular one. God will not put more in you than you can bear. I've heard that so many times. And we hear that at funerals all the time, too. God won't put more in you than you can bear, honey. <laughs> all right. That's not in the Bible. The Bible says there hath no temptation, no temptation, temptation, temptation taken you, but such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. It's talking about temptation. 
It's not talking about anything else. Stop adding things to the Bible. All right, here's a good one. Love the sinner, hate the sin. Where is that in the Bible? Never heard that? Love the sinner, hate the sin. It ain't in the Bible. It's nowhere. I'm so glad y'all here. God requires us to obey his word. How can we obey his word if we don't know his word? How can we obey his word if we got his word wrong? How can we obey his word if we take the word of God almighty, which is powerful, and we take it out of context and use it for something else? Stop misquoting scriptures. Stop misquoting scriptures. All right. The Bible says, or the Bible doesn't say, this is question 11 and we got one more to go. The Bible says, or the Bible doesn't say to anoint your head with olive oil. Anoint your head with olive oil. All right, I'm going to read this to you. Moreover, the Lord said unto Moses, saying, Take thou also unto thee principal spices. That means some very precious and important spices of myrrh. 500 shekels. That means he's telling you the weight, uh, how much of it to get, like ounces. All right. And sweet cinnamon, half so much. And 250 shekels. He's telling you exactly how much to make. And of sweet calamus, 250 shekels. And of cassia, 500 shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary. And of the olive oil and hen. Why do we only limit it to olive oil? We took everything out, uh, else out and we just only going to go with olive oil. That's it. And the Lord and thou shall make it an oil of holy ointment, an ointment compound after the art of apothecary. That is a pharmacist. So that means God is telling you to do this in the same precision manner as a pharmacist would do it. And that it says it shall be an holy anointing oil, not olive oil. Where did you read that olive oil is a substitute? For what the Bible tells you to do. Give me a book, give me the scripture, and give me the verse where it says olive oil instead of what God specifically told you. I'm not dealing with the time when it worked. All right. I'm, not, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. This is what the Bible says. I'm not I'm not going against if the pray, if yes, it's possible. The pastor prayed for you, he put oil on you, he could put so much oil on you, you slide out the door. But the Bible told you what kind of oil to use. Why would we ignore that? Just think of what happened. If God healed you of whatever ailment you had because the pastor used olive oil, imagine if he would have used the exact oil God told him to use. Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure oil beaten for the light to cause the lamps to burn continually. Maybe, maybe that, does it say olive oil? Okay, I'm sorry, I misread it. Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure oil, olive, beaten for the light. So here's where the Bible says to use olive oil, but it's for the light. It's not for, for anointing people and praying for people. All right. Repeat after me, everybody. Lord, you can trust me with your word. Lord, you can trust me with your word. I won't abuse it. I won't abuse it. I won't diminish it. I will obey it. Yeah, yeah.